how does wokeism impact India and Indians everywhere in the world? And what is the role of the United States in making this happen? This is the topic of this conversation with Asra Nomani. Please don't miss. And you mentioned how this intellectual mobilization is behind a whole lot of anti-India propaganda. Yes. Whether it is the Dismantle Hindutva Conference, whether it is articles in BBC, articles in Wall Street Journal, uh, you know, all sorts of things in the social media. It seems that there is an agenda, there is a conspiracy. It's not like separate incidents no. that are random here no. and there. Mo that same machine that had been pushing the very fundamentalist interpretation of Islam in the United States, funded by governments overseas like Qatar, Saudi Arabia, now Turkey, and then many elements within the Pakistani government, they had decided that India was going to be their next target. Reza Aslan went there and he met one of the Babas, right? And that was the famous scene where he supposedly ate human brain. He pejorative, he was really negative, yes. demonizing Hinduism. As cannibals. Right, as cannibals. Is open society is not just giving people money through their one operation. They create so many mm. funds. And this one fund, that the Proteus Fund, was funneling money. And the revenue line just increased exponentially through the 2000s until today. And that money is being used to fund this attack on India. United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. Yeah, these guys I know. These right. guys, I've had a long relationship with right. these guys. And this you know, several years ago, I went there just before COVID, I went there to meet the commissioners. Yes. And to complain about their report on India. Right. Because it was not correct. Right. So they brought in the person who writes the report. It's a young Pakistani graduate from American University who got his degree from Akbar Ahmed. There you who got go. His PhD. Circle the wagons. On, yeah. on religious violence in South Asia. Right. And he never talks about Pakistan or anything. He talks about India. That's his PhD. Right. And he's the guy writing the report. Namaste again. I have Asra with me. We have done three episodes. In the first one, her life story as a Muslim from India, living in the United States, working for the Wall Street Journal as a journalist covering South Asia, very good friends with Daniel Pearl, and how his murder, which is really happening when she's right there, and it happens right there when she's there, in, this, in uh, Karachi, how it transforms her and turns her into, uh, makes, uh, makes a life, lifelong uh, cause out of it to fight radical Islam. And then in the second episode, we talked about the Axis, the, the alliance, the collaboration between radical Islam and the left. Why it happened, how it happened, where it happened. And then in the third episode, we talked about breaking America, how that is breaking America. Similar to the Breaking India book I wrote over a dozen years ago, I started writing a book called Breaking America, which I have yet to put out. And that, of course, got diverted when I wrote Snakes in the Ganga, but I want to go back and finish Breaking America. So we had a good conversation on that. Now in this fourth episode, we're going to talk about how all this is the biggest export of the United States today, wokeism, and this whole nonsense has replaced American export of free market and capitalism and uh, technology and uh, you know the new uh, kind of a world order. All that is being replaced with a new foreign policy of the United States, which is U.S. policy through U.N., through World Bank, through the State Department, and how this is targeting India. And what is the role of globalists like World Economic Forum, like George Soros, and so on. Yeah. So welcome back. Oh, thank and you. And let's get started. Thank you. And, you know, I speak to you in this episode with a place of love for my home country. India was the place of my birth. It was where I spent the first four years of my life, first with my mother and my father, and then with my dadi and dada in Hyderabad. My ancestry is 
rooted in India. Every bit of my voice and my clarity and is channeling this inherited ancestry that I have. And so now that I see India, beautiful India, do you remember the campaign from some years ago, the marketing campaign? Beautiful India. Now I Incredible see, India. Incredible India, yes. And it was such a simple idea, right? And now I wonder how did that happen? And that's what I started to explore. How did it happen that incredible India went from hero to zero, right? In the eyes of America. And now they're trying to tarnish it in the world. How did that happen? And that's what I want to talk to you about. So, you know, we already mentioned George Soros, who's funded a lot of stuff in the United States. And the, the rise of the, of the Democratic Party as a mechanism for Islam. Uh, you know, le Democrats were always sort of left of center, but not so radical. Yes. And the, the, what they call the progressive wing has taken over. But worse than that, they've uh, brought in Islam and uh, brought in a coalition of left Islam and blacks into the de as the people who are running the Democratic Party. And in each case, it's the activist wing of these identity groups, yes. you know, not yes. the majority of the people. It's the most ideological, hardcore, radical elements. And you mentioned how this intellectual mobilization is behind a whole lot of anti-India propaganda. Yes. Whether it is the Dismantle Hindutva Conference, whether it is articles in BBC, articles in Wall Street Journal, uh, you know, all sorts of things in the social media. It seems that there is an agenda, there is a conspiracy. It's not like separate incidents no. that are random here no. and there. Mo speak to Indians who feel, especially Hindus, who like to deny the problem and say, well, you know, maybe somebody is misinformed. Oh, right. Maybe somebody is ignorant, but we, why should we care? That sort of thing. Yeah, you know, so people should understand my worldview is to always examine the machine, the industry behind anything. I came out of my training as a journalist covering corporate America. So everything to me it must be looked at through the lens of money, financing, um, marketing operations, and business operations. And so my first clue uh, personally to this new industry of anti-India movement happened when I started going to the conferences of the Islamic Society of North America. So what is ISNA? It's what the name is. What is it? It's supposed to be like a community organization, but it's much more than that. It's where they push their very fundamentalist ideology. It's where I went when I was younger fighting for Muslim reform and I introduced at one of the ISNA conventions a Muslim Bill of Rights for women in the mosque and in the bedroom. Because I said, from the private space to the public space, we are denied our equal rights. And that's when I got my first death threat. It was from a young student of computer science, and he sent me an anonymous death threat. And what did it say? Death to Asra. And I went back to the conferences because I can't you know, take a hint that I'm not welcome. And I started seeing new events being organized against India. And I thought, what is happening here? What is this machine? So that same machine that had been pushing the very fundamentalist interpretation of Islam in the United States, funded by governments overseas like Qatar, Saudi Arabia, now Turkey, and then many elements within the Pakistani government, they had decided that India was going to be their next target. Israel has been so the target USA, for many years. So USA, Israel were there, and now India is part of it. Exactly. And I wondered to myself, why? And I saw the data that, as you probably know, Indonesia has the largest population of Muslims, but India will soon become the largest population of Muslims. It's a huge market. So thinking again like a business person, thinking again like an investigative reporter covering an industry, they want the market share, right? And India also has resources. They have wealth in the mineral resources. And it was probably the, the climax of the whole uh, Islam history. 
and the Islamic history. The whole Islamic exactly. history in India was probably more grand from an Islamic point of view than anywhere else in the world. The Mughal Empire. Sure. You know, and these are people we talked about in the first episode who are wound collectors. They have no statute of limitations on their grievances. They want to rip they want the rise of the Ottoman Empire again. They want the rise of this Mughal Empire, but with their interpretation of Islam, not that, you know, that crazy stuff where they were including Hindu traditions. You know, we're going to get rid of that in this new era. But who was the who were the faces of it? They were Muslims in America, like this Pakistani Muslim guy, I don't know if you know him, his name is Wajahat Ali. He's a Pakistani Muslim, he grew up in Fremont, California. His dad was working in the technology industry. Father and mother even went to jail for stealing software from Microsoft. Reza Aslan, an Iranian. Now that's an important name. Tell yes. us about him because he's, he's really a problem. Yes, so Reza Aslan, arrived in the United States as a young boy. His parents fled the 1979 revolution. So you think, oh, okay, they fled the theocracy of this mullahs that had come to power. But then as he grows from boyhood into manhood, he becomes a writer, he becomes a so-called academic, and his first book was a book called No God But God. And he seemed like, he presented like he's a progressive Muslim. He presented like a liberal Muslim. He argued, it was a, one of the first times that I saw a scholar argue that a woman is not required to wear a headscarf. As I'm sitting before you as a Muslim woman and I'm not wearing a headscarf. And, and I thought, wow, finally, you know, a Muslim who has the, the courage to challenge the orthodoxy. But then Reza Aslan found a new opportunity. I don't know if you remember, there was a movement to create the Ground Zero Mosque, remember? Yes, I remember very well. Right? Yes. So that was 2010. Yes. So by 2010... I know the, the Imam and his wife, yes. very charismatic and all right. that, who wanted to raise these funds and all that stuff. Yeah, I know them. Yeah, and they presented progressive. Yes. They presented like they were Sufi Muslims. Right, you know, right. They had a woman as an Imam even. Right. You know, like crazy radical ideas. Women prayed in the same room as men. Astaghfirullah, as they say, forgive me, you know, my sin. Well, Reza Aslan, I was in on those phone calls in the fall of 2010. I heard his new strategy. And he was telling the Muslim community, oh, they don't want to build a mosque at, near the World Trade Center? That's the name Ground Zero Mosque? Tell them then, tell America, Tell the firefighters, tell the victims' families of the 9-11 attacks, tell them that they are now engaging in Islamophobia. They are now racist. And that's how they tried. Obama, remember, was president then? That's how they tried. That, that this was their machine building up to use race as their cudgel, as their hammer to shame people and to get what they wanted. Well, as a Muslim, I stood up along with my fellow Muslim reformers and we said, no, if this hurts the sensibilities of the families of the victims, find another home. You know, and I did some investigative reporting and it was a very dodgy, shady operation. Boy, they didn't like it. You know, they didn't like this opposition, but that's what Reza Aslan began. He began his now, his hijacking of the left. Now he's a very big shot. Yes. So tell us about his role and his influence today. Well, I don't know if people remember, he ended up getting a CNN program. Yes. Do you remember his mm -hmm. show? Yes. And I went to the banks of the Ganges River. I went to the banks of the Ganga. I have gone into the temples. I have had the honor of having people share with me Hinduism, and I studied Buddhism right outside of Varanasi then. Reza Aslan went there and he met one of the Babas, right? And that was the famous scene where he supposedly ate human brain. He pejorative, he was really negative, yes. demonizing Hinduism. 
as cannibals. Right, as cannibals. And you know, thank goodness there is a line in people's sensibilities sometimes. And I stood up, others stood up, and he kept his show. He got his show. Like, again, just because he offended one billion people, it didn't matter. And he, you know, he's claiming the victim status for Muslims all the time. He hurts the sensibilities of Hindus and but he's CNN a big, doesn't... big deal in media. Yeah, he's a big deal. So he thinks he has free reign. And that's the problem with silence, is that when you don't speak up, these people take liberties then. They capture more territory. Yes. And that's why it's so important. Even if somebody creates an anonymous Twitter account, even if they write their letter to the editor with the initials of their name, even if you use a you know, virtual private network and send an email to the president of the this, of the that, your voice is so important. And we raised our voice then, but Reza kept his job. And then what I saw was Reza, this early attack on Hinduism as cannibalistic, it became part of this movement. And what we discovered, what I discovered was it was a well-funded enterprise by this network of organizations that had created an alphabet soup of names like the Council on American Islamic Relations, funded by whom? These foreign governments, these state actors, people. And George Soros type people. And, and what they had done because of their cleverness now is they got <clears throat> the foundations in liberal philanthropy, like open society. And I don't know if you know the name of this organization called the Proteus Fund. Because what they did is open society is not just p giving people money through their one operation. They create so many mm. funds. And this one fund, that the Proteus Fund, was funneling money, creating grants, $10,000, $20,000, $100,000, $300,000. I watched in America, we have this thing called the 990 for 501c3s, yes. which are nonprofits. I started seeing the 990s and the revenue line just increase exponentially through the 2000s until today. And that money is being used to fund this attack on India. So what do you think of some of the other people? Like, what do you think of Fareed Zakaria? You know, I watched Fareed Zakaria the other day, and I said to myself, Fareed, you have had the beneficiary. You have been the beneficiary of America. And you stay silent against this unholy alliance. And he's not somebody we can ever approach as Hindus, and although he's from India, right. and expect any fair hearing. No. He he's tries to be very liberal to the whites, liberal on uh, Islam, uh, criticizing Islam, Sometimes. Sometimes. But, but in, not, a, in a very careful way. Right. And he accepts but he'll these never, theocracies. He, he, he'll, and he accepts. And never has he stood up for any Hindu cause, even when, the, when things have become very bad and very blatantly bad for us. Yeah. And let's just examine the decisions he's making on just this issue of the theocracies that he has supported. And it's him, it's the Brookings Institution, you know, it's this entire machine of, of uh, foreign policy, quote, experts, Carnegie, uh, so many of them, Asia Society, they have these alliances. Council on Foreign Relations. Yes, Council on Foreign World Relations. World Economic Forums. Yeah. They, they accept the money, the credibility, and the, uh, the stamp of approval of Governments that you could kindly call theocracies, like Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and now Turkey. Pakistani interest groups that run the government and the country like a theocracy with religious law. So they accept these countries. And, and let's, let's, um, let's just look at Qatar, Saudi Arabia, you know, um, United Arab Emirates, even. We have to be honest about yeah. these. Mm -hmm. These are kingdoms, 
man-made kingdoms. So, who in the United States would you say are the plants, the Islamic plants, besides some of these names, and the the persons who were close to Hillary Clinton? Of course, she's no longer in power. Plus, some of the Congress women in the Democratic Party today, yes, like Omar, a few people like that. Who are some of the important ones in various institutions, whether it's media, government, think tanks, etc. One easy way to measure this is who is it that accepts these dictatorships, mm. okay? So Farid Zakaria has done apologetics for these dictatorships while, like you rightly said, not standing up for the democracy that is India. Who else? I've watched it. At Georgetown University, there's a man by the name of John Esposito, and he has created an empire at Georgetown University called the Bin Talal Center for Christian Muslim Understanding. You notice he intentionally left out Jews. There's no mention of Hindus, forget that, and Buddhists, forget it, you know. That has become a beachhead now for anti-India attack. Where else? You have this Center for Islamic, the Islamic Study of Democracy. The Triple IT has a different name in the United States. In, it's the Institute of, Inter, of Islamic Thought, International Islamic Thought. It's based in Northern Virginia. You have um, so many organizations that are also uh, ally, allied with the U.S. government. And I, I have a couple examples I'm going to show you. Um, I don't know if you've seen this amazing intellectual report, but you can see what it is. Read what the title is. The Nazification of India. And what are the images? Hitler and Modi. Twelve parallels between the two of them. Yes. And what is the organization? Can you see? I'm going to see if I can show you um, the clue of... It's not, it's not easy to find it, but it is... What's the word here? You can see down here in little writing. It's an organization called Sound Vision. Sound Vision. Doesn't that sound great? Yeah. And, and what is their concept? Justice. Who could argue with justice? But this is the character assassination. And what is it that they are doing? They show you, download a free copy of this report, request prints of it, and request a speaker or trainer. So does this just happen in... I mean, this is a well-funded This is a well-funded campaign. And who is pushing this? Who's this organization? They've been around for a while, yeah. The Council on American-Islamic Relations. It says, U.S. groups unite to prevent genocide of Indian Muslims. Yes. And condemn latest Islamophobia in India. Exactly. And it's not just one group. What they have come together is they had a two-day event preventing genocide of Indian Muslims. You know, so this is, this is the machine. And that's recent, just a month ago. Yep, that's what I wanted to show you. So they are doing <clears throat> lobbying in the United States. What you do is you take busloads of people to Congress and you hand out talking points. I've covered so many of these lobbying campaigns as a journalist. I covered a campaign of the... So you take a whole, several hundred of them and give them cards with talking points. Exactly. Because they're dumb, they don't know, but they're activists. The scholars draft a few talking points right. and everybody will raise those issues. And remember, funded, because you've got communications people that are writing the talking points, you've got the printing. And guess where this year's started? Guess where it began? Where? Well, Maryland, so innocent, right? Where? At the Turkish mosque, funded by the government of Turkey. Because Erdogan, the leader of Turkey, fancies himself the new caliph. Yeah. He wants to see the rise of the Ottoman Empire, and now it should include India. And they went in busloads from the Turkish mosque, which the Americans love because they have a Turkish bath. You know, it's, they've made a hammam. You know, they, they've made it attractive. Spa. Yes. Nice spa. It's nice spa. So they've made it attractive for the Americans, making it non-threatening. But with this, this is, this, this is a serious allegation. Yeah. 
But this Turkish push, link is a very important one very Indians important. should know about. They have to know about it. And my mother, she watches her soap operas, you know, and she said, this Turkish soap opera, so popular, romanticizing the Ottoman Empire, romanticizing the, the code that they had, bringing back that, that, that yesteryear. And what does it do? It feeds the wounds. It feeds, and this is what they're creating new wounds. And let's not pretend that this is just foreign governments, because what is this the seal of that you see here? It's the United States. It's the United States. And what is this organization? You can see here, what's that subtitle that they have it? It's about India, right? View the India chapter in our annual report. And whose annual report is this? Religious freedom conditions in India are taking a drastic turn downward. And they are pushing with national and various state governments tolerating widespread harassment and violence against religious minorities. So they're pushing this idea. I don't know if you can read this small print. Can you read it on who it is? United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. Yeah, these guys I know. These right. guys, I've had a long relationship with right. these guys. And this you know, uh, several years ago, I went there just before COVID, I went there to meet the commissioners. Yes. And to complain about their report on India. Right. Because it was not correct. Right. So they brought in the person who writes the report. It's a young Pakistani graduate from American University who got his degree from Akbar Ahmed. There you who go. Got his PhD. Circle the wagons. On, yeah. on religious violence in South Asia. Right. And he never talks about Pakistan or anything. He talks about India. That's his PhD. Right. And he's the guy writing the report. And so they're grooming young people. Yes. And they are creating keyboard warriors of them. It's a whole keyboard, a whole yeah. uh, ecosystem. Right. Well funded, well thought out, great strategy for them. Yeah. And why does it matter? I just want to share with you my personal stake in this. My family came from India, right? I want to just show you some of the... This is India. This is to me my India. Who are the people here? This is my father. This is me. Oh. Wearing kajal because my daddy had to protect me from Nazar, right? This is my mother. And you can see the burqa on some of my aunts, right? But we were living, this is my mamu who imported kurtas to America. He was a businessman with creating the Lucknowi chicken industry. And my father came to America not to flee persecution, but just for the opportunity of America. And I want to show you, this was my parents as young. Ah, okay. I know, as young people, right? Very interesting. Isn't that interesting? So you can see, I feel like they're sitting with us. And my father is now 89. My mother is 83. And this is, look at the TV. You know, this is the photo from India. My dad in his flannel shirt, a young PhD student. And he was, loves India. He loves India. My mother loves India to this day. We know that... Um, um, India has challenges like every country. You know, we have to do whatever we can to make our nation great, greater, right? But I grew up, and this was my school that I went to in America, um, Martin Luther King Elementary School. Can you, can you see me? Can you spot me? Well, is that you? That's me. Yeah. And that's the little girl, little Muslim girl who prospered. And look at this diversity. And can you see the name of our school? Yeah. What's the name? Martin Luther King. I know. And now, in mm -hmm. the name of social justice, what, are the, what is this woke movement doing? They're creating division among people. They're creating hate. They're creating this demonization of 
great people, great nations for their own agenda. And that's what I want people to really So what know. I want to ask you is this. Uh, Indian Muslims uh, have serious problems in education, in economics yes. and so on. And another issue is politically be guided often by the local mosque. Right. And the local mosque often being guided by some foreign, some Saudi funding or right. from somewhere. So the perception that Hindus have may be right or wrong is that Muslims are sort of drifting or gone into Pakistan's orbit or Middle East orbit or Iranian orbit or somebody else's orbit. Whereas in my father's time, some of his best friends in Lahore were Muslims. Right. He went to government college Lahore. He had pictures there, family albums. I mean, they even after partition, they kept in touch with each other. That's so beautiful. So, uh, it seems that the relationship between the two communities has been on again, off again, love, hate, some violence, some friendship. But in the in going forward, there has to be a sort of a, what I call Swadeshi Muslim. Swadeshi is born and brought up and right. and. Proud yes. of India. Swadesh means my country. Right. So nationalistic, patriotic Muslims yes. in India. How to bring that about? And uh, clearly you are a Swadeshi Muslim because you are very patriotic towards India, very loyal towards India. And you, are, you have no qualms about standing up and giving help to the mosque and the leaders in the mosque and the Islamic radicals and risking your life, which you've done. But how to how to bring this and uh, make this more mainstream among the Muslims in India. Yeah, and we've had this tension, you know, in, in even our Indian Muslim experience, because you probably know the place of Dioband. In, yes. Right? So from Dioband came this interpretation of Islam called Diobandi. Yes. And the Diobandi Islam is similar to the Saudi Islam. That is correct. Right? And it fueled the... Pakistani militants, it fueled the Afghan Wahhabi. militants, right, it married with right. the Wahhabism. But my ancestor from my father's side was a man named Shibli Nomani. In the turn of the 20th century, this Diobandi Islam was expanding and he resisted it. He believed in the Islam that Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan was also promoting of intellectualism, practice as a Muslim. So he, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan created Aligarh Muslim University. Shibli Nomani created Shibli College. My father and my mother, if you think about it, they then emerged out of that ethos. My mom went to Catholic school. My father came to America to study. You so know, how to scale this? That, exactly. That, and we have to remember, like, we have had this challenge, but now the in, intrusion of a Diobandi type of Islam is coming from these foreign governments, like you said. So what we have to do is what we have to do with all movements is that we have to produce our own spokespeople, you know, people who will represent this type of Indian Islam that is authentic and, to me, purer than the divisiveness of the in, in imported Islam and the, the creation of this Diobandi Islam. We have to um, scale the, their speaking to the world, to other Muslims. There are two or three challenges in yeah. doing that. We, of course we want to do that, but there are challenges. One right. is, historically and theologically, the center of Islam will always remain Saudi Arabia. That's it. You cannot, a Muslim somewhere else cannot say, I, I don't agree with what they're saying, because that's the center. They are the official keepers. You but have we have said it, and we do say it, and we have <coughs> to say it. We do have to say it. Because Has there ever been a successful revolt against Saudi Arabia by Muslims in a sustained manner? Well, I would argue that the way that Muslims in India have been practicing the religion has been a sustained opposition to that interpretation. That's what's been beautiful. But that's pre-globalization, pre, most of it. Pre this last couple decades. But see, now with globalization reducing distances, money moves, ideas move on your cell phone, you know what the guy there is saying. 
So now this globalization of discourse, globalization of activism, th this new globalized Islam is asserting itself like never before. So the previous in previous centuries, the challenge wasn't there because a few people would travel all the way to Makkah, come back. It was very small amount of influence. So things were isolated geographically and so you could have your own, own interpretation. But now it's difficult to be outside the influence when all your kids and all your, your mosques and your, um, wherever you go, the madrasas, they're all tuned into what's happening somewhere else. So I do believe we do have to scale our movement. You know, we have to take the <clears throat> same talking points and strategy that they have and turn it on our, in our direction. We have to globalize our movement. We do. So that's an important point. Yeah. It cannot just be, we will mind our own business and ignore no. them. You actually have to take them on. Yes. You actually have to produce Indian, Swadeshi, Muslim leaders with firepower, with scholarship, have conferences, have journals, by, you know, right. taking on those right. guys and saying, you are wrong. Yes. Maybe geographically it started there, but that doesn't mean you are the expert today. No, you are actually, you know, we have this concept in Islam to try to shut others up and say you're doing bida, which means innovation. You're changing <clears> what <throat> was originally intended. And ultimately, I believe that if we're going to have a practice of Islam that is a, an Islam of grace and coexistence and kindness and peacefulness, we have to go to the best teachings that we can find of progress. So even if there were ideas that are incompatible with the 21st century in the 7th century, we have to still find whatever pro progressive movement there was and tap into it. So like what's one example? I will just say that you know, at that time, the women in that area of Mecca were supposedly treated so badly that they had no rights. So then they didn't get equal rights, but supposedly within Islam, they were given more rights than they had previously gotten. We have inspiration of people like Khadija, the first wife of the Prophet Muhammad, who was a businesswoman. We have Aisha. So what you're saying wife. is, uh, use role models yes. and use examples even if they are imperfect, yes. but they, are, they can be the starting point. Right, and we have them in Indian history of great Muslim leaders. And I personally got so much inspiration from my Muslim women sisters in India because they are working honestly within such a difficult ecosystem, as you put it, you know, of real embedded patriarchy and discrimination and sexism. But I went to Tamil Nadu then to meet the woman Sharifa who was starting a woman's mosque because they weren't allowed in the mosque, which was actually the men's mosque. And it was in the mosque that all the decisions about divorce, child custody, you know, important family law decisions were being made. So she was building brick by brick a woman's mosque. And I had the tradition of my daddy, you know, who learned to ride a, uh, who learned to drive a car, who traveled freely in India, who refused to wear the burqa. My mother, we have that inherited ancestry. And even if it's not called Shakti, you know, within the Muslim families, it is Shakti power. And I know that we have those women who fought against the talaq, talaq, talaq. Uh, so one, one uh, counter is women. That's yes. One. Okay. The second obstacle or hurdle is the certain surahs, certain statements written in the Quran itself. Right. So there are a lot of wonderful statements about peace, love, harmony, compassion. And then there are statements that can be interpreted yes. and have been interpreted in a pretty hideous way. Right. And since the Quran is not subject to, not available for uh, any amendment. You cannot even deactivate one sentence and say, okay, we won't say this anymore because they'll accuse you of uh, blasphemy. So what do you do about that kind of a text today? Yeah. So what I have learned is that the study of sacred text has just got a fancy word of hermeneutics. And in hermeneutics, there's many approaches. You can take the word literally, you can take it figuratively, you can say that the idea has now been uh, 
surpassed by another idea. And so there's many approaches in theology on how to handle sacred text. The Christians have had to handle difficult verses in the Bible. Hermeneutics is a very sort of a liberal methodology for reinterpreting. But hermeneutics may not be available to Orthodox Islam. They might say, we don't like all this hermeneutics. Of course, hermeneutics. of course, they don't like it. So now you're bringing in a, a, a culture of reinterpretation which may not be welcome. So therefore, there is a butting of heads there in is. power structure. There is. How do you do that? We just have to do it. You know, we've ha we have to do it just like <clears throat> others before us have done in other faiths. Even in Hinduism, there have been challenges to traditions, and in Islam, we have to do the same, and that's what we're doing. We, in America, we started... See, in, in, in Hinduism, it's uh, easier. In, in, in the Abrahamic religions, because of the one book idea. Yeah. And one history. One unique historical event. Hinduism doesn't have one unique historical event. I can, I can believe in Krishna, his history, literally, or I can not. Mm -hmm. And I can be fine Hindu. There's no right. blasphemy on me. I can believe in this text, but I can believe in that text. We have many revelations and not a final one. So it's sort of like many rishis, many incarnations have been very prolific in explaining to us the truth. And you can latch on to this one. I can latch on to that one. We are both Hindus. Yeah. This is a very amazing diversity within Hinduism. People talk about religious diversity across religions. Right. We have within Hinduism more diversity than all the other religions put together. So therefore, why, when we've had problems, we've been able to reach out to a different place, mm -hmm. a different deity, right. a different story, a different uh, reinterpretation by so many people. And therefore, the, we're not as boxed in. As, say, so the same problem would be with Judaic Christianity also. But Christianity had to fight for 200 years, violent wars in Europe, to loosen the grip of the, uh, the bishops and the Vatican. It was not an easy thing to do. The Reformation was a very painful thing. Yeah. Now, in Islam, it hasn't started per se, in, in, that, in, in earnest. Well, we have had it in history, okay. because in the 9th and 10th century, so Islam <clears throat> is born in the 7th century, and so then it evolves and new practices take place, expansion happens. You, as you've called it, you could call it colonization, I think, to be fair. Well, by the 9th, 10th century, another school of jurisprudence has emerged that's called the Mutazalite tradition, and it's in Iraq. And what they practice is critical thinking, this concept called ishtihad, which is critical thinking but they are a threat to the orthodoxy. And there's a war and the Mutazilites get defeated. And that's when some people in history say the gates to Ishtihad were closed. That was the closing to critical thinking. And what has emerged into today's day, unfortunately in Sunni Islam, is just four schools of jurisprudence that are very similar. And I'll use one example that I think is benign, we think it's benign, but important. All four schools except one school, the Maliki tradition, say that you cannot have a dog as a pet inside your home. And what they do is they say that there is a hadith or a saying of the Prophet Muhammad that no angel will enter your home if you have a dog inside. So I think people know this from families in India, Dogs are kept outside sometimes in Muslim families. Maybe they're the guard dog, they have a job. But the Maliki tradition departs and they allow dogs as pets. So what's a child to do in America when they want that cute little puppy, you know, at the pound? Their father tells them, oh no, it's not permissible, permissible in Islam. But then why? Because they're dirty. But now we have vets, we have rabies shots, you know, we have care for the dogs, they're not, quote, dirty anymore. And so what we are doing on that interpretation, for example, is we're challenging it. And we're saying, no, there's this, this and that reason that dogs are acceptable. And people are practicing that. So in our house, 
some uh, 10 years ago, I got a dog. Her name was Lily. She was this beautiful dog that looks like a fox. And I said to my mother, I said, can Lily come in the house? And she said, of course. I said, what about so those? those are, but see, your family is a, count, is a rare example. It's not so rare, though, because in Iran, there are families with dogs as pets, even though this is what the government of Iran wants to preach. And that's just one little example. What about the headscarf, right? The Saudis, they, the Iranians, they want to tell us that a Muslim woman must wear a headscarf in order to be pure. But so many women, including so many Muslim women in India, have never worn headscarf. My dadi took it off. They called it the hijab, as if that means scarf. But it doesn't mean scarf. It means separation. And separation is not a scarf. You know, it means some level of, of modesty, some level of, you know, etiquette. But it doesn't have to mean a scarf. So, and you know the women in Iran. They are refusing it. There's a movement. There's a movement fighting for their rights. So I don't want people to, um, to think that we don't exist because we do, but what we have to do is convince everyone. You know, we have to win that war of ideas. So let me now ask you this. Okay, so those are hurdles, the hurdle of uh, Saudi and foreign funding uh, and the hurdle of uh, Quran can be offset with enough reformations, enough debates, enough people challenging, and hopefully that will happen. But it will take time. It won't be happen very quickly. Uh, what do you think is the future of Pakistan? Let's discuss that. Because oh Pakistan goodness. and India were the similar DNA, similar background when we started out. And that was another experiment. So they went into Islam as sort of the primary reason for existence. Right. And India didn't say we are Hindu Rashtra. The idea of Hindu Rashtra, by the way, has been misunderstood. The RSS idea of Hindu is not Hindu faith. Mm -hmm. It's anyone who is, you are a Hindu according to them because you are born of Hindu ancestry. So if you are a Muslim, Christian, Jew, anything, you are a Hindu if you are Indian because your origin was that. That's a, um, we can debate whether mm -hmm. it's a reasonable right. definition of Hinduism or not. I'm not too convinced. But it is under that definition that they are claiming a Hindu Rashtra, mm -hmm. which means people are of Hindu origin originally, whatever they may have converted into later on. Right. So that's not the same thing as a sort of a theocracy per se. So because they allow this internal diversity. Why is it that Pakistan has gone this way? They could have also produced a tech industry. They could have produced IITs. They are the same kind of people. They got brains. When you meet a Pakistani, they're intelligent people. Why didn't they develop their country as a technological, scientific kind of like in India, the the whole thing is about how to make the, how to build infrastructure, how to get science and technology and go to the moon and so all that. The aspirations of young people right. are if you, a good thing is you ask young people. Okay. Hardly anyone will say that I want to go fight the world and radicalize the world and right. spread my religion and take over and send bombs here and there. You don't have that kind of a ideal. And you don't have the a Bin Laden equivalent being glorified by moms who name their kids like that. Right. But in Pakistan, it's weird. So what has happened? To, I mean, the common uh, argument given is that the ISI cut a deal with the mullahs to stay in power right. and to, you know, uh, throw out democracy. Well, 1947 happens and using the dog as an <clears throat> example, Jinnah had a dog, right? He had an interpretation of Islam. He wasn't even from Sunni Islam. He was a Ismaili Muslim. Many people don't talk about that, but he was out of the Shia tradition. Was he Ismaili? You know, I think uh, he was Shia. Okay. Right. So he was Shia. And many people don't talk about that because the Shias ended up becoming also ostracized, right, within the Sunni Islam. So he had a dog, he enjoyed his whiskey, you know, he defied these traditional rules of the orthodoxy. So Jinnah, his sister, you know, they represented secular Islam, uh, secular governance, and it, the nation moved through the decades. But the pivotal year in the Muslim world was 1979, when 
Iranian revolution happens in Iran. The Saudi revolution begins pushing their extremist interpretation. It comes to Pakistan. And I know this because I witnessed it. I did my first trip to Pakistan in the summer of 1983. And there my family was spread from Karachi to Lahore to Islamabad. I went to Peshawar and I played into the night gin rummy with my male cousins. We played on the train. It was so much fun. But I saw one of my cousins. She was my pen pal from all my years growing up. And all of a sudden, my cousin said that we couldn't play with the boys anymore because it was that strict interpretation, that strict gender divide. And then she said that she needed to start covering her hair in order to be a good Muslim girl. So she was now embedding into her mind the strict Saudi interpretation of Islam, not the one that my family practiced. And I saw, I went to the Afghan border, you know, and I saw the Soviets there, the soldiers, and all around was the influence of the leader now, Zia al Haq, in Pakistan. They now had Sharia law about hudud, the boundaries of, of behavior in society. They started criminalizing social behaviors according to the interpretations of the Saudis. And that's, as you know, when they started creating the Mujahideen. And when the war ended in 1989, as everybody knows from the subcontinent, the leaders of Pakistan turned from that war against the Soviets to the war against India to claim Kashmir. And those militants became Kashmiri militants. And it's from that culture that this young man in London named Umar Sheikh became radicalized at the mosques in London, took a trip to Pakistan to join the Kashmir fight, got an assignment to go to Delhi to kidnap tourists, was fortunately arrested, put in that Tihar jail, but then freed on, in 1999, leading then to the kidnapping of my friend Danny Pearl. Right. That is the long history that continues to this day. And the government of Pakistan will not end its just dangerous, dangerous manufacturing and support of these militants. They are so embedded in the society. And I know because I studied the lives of each one of these men that were involved in my friend Danny Pearl's kidnapping and killing and they are part of the society. So we hope that uh, your counter-revolution prevails. That's it will prevail. Okay. We will win because we have no choice. We must win. So, you know, I just want viewers to know that, I mean, I got a lot of criticism and attack, personal attacks, when I proposed Swadeshi Muslim as a category. Mm. A lot of people saying, how could you do that? You're betraying us, blah, 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 this and that. So then I asked them, give me your alternative. What do you want to do? Right. What is your alternative? What ha has anybody done? I mean, this may take 100 years, but you know, we, we need to nurture right. certain people like right. this. We find a person here and a person there. We encourage them. We nurture them. Some are in India, some are in US, some are in Canada, here and there. We build organizations around them. Uh, you know, you are a very vocal person, very brilliant as a journalist with a lot of clout, a lot of connections. We have to support such a person. I, I, I'm one of the reasons I'm doing this uh, mini series is I want uh, people in India to support you. Oh, thank you so and, much. And, and I think we, your ideas yesterday on the kind of things we should work on together, we're going to discuss them. Good. And so we'll continue. We'll continue having these kind of episodes. Yeah, because I agree with you. You know, I had a choice when they, these extremists murdered my friend Danny Pearl in the name of Islam. I had rage and anger in my heart for them. And I had a choice, you know, I could leave Islam. I live in the United States of America, it's not a crime. But we have to fight for that which we believe in. And I want to tell everybody that 
we're never going to eliminate Islam. There is, or any big or, organized religion. Yeah, it's never going to happen. So we have to, it's, it's that quote from Gandhi, be the change you want to see in the world. You know, create that reality that you want to see. Like you said, support it. Support the young people. Support those that get targeted, like yourself, for attack. Because we, you know, in India and in Hinduism and the philosophy, we believe in consciousness, as you talk about so much. And we can change the collective global consciousness if we breathe a new reality. And we can do it. And on that, we will conclude. And I want to thank you for these wonderful episodes we've done. And we'll uh, get some good reactions and responses from the, from the, from the public. And we'll engage them again. Yes. We'll do some more. Uh, and uh, all the best to you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. We will succeed. Yes, we will. Thank you.